Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our session about what musical minds can teach us about innovation. Uh, my name is Panos Pane, and I'm the Senior Vice President at uh, Berkeley College of Music. I'm in charge of global strategy and innovation. And with us, we have a fantastic group of very accomplished musicians and entrepreneurs to explore this, this very point. Um, with me, uh, Michael Hendricks is joining me, who is the co-writer of a book uh, that we wrote that's coming out on April 6th of the same uh, subject matter uh, called Two Beats Ahead, What Musical Minds Can Teach Us About Innovation. And in it, we're really exploring the applicability and transferability of the way that uh, musicians go about relating with their environment, whether it's through collaboration, uh, performing, uh, expressing themselves, improvising, iterating, and what we can learn from them, not just in the world of uh, performing uh, traditional uh, music, dance, and theater, but ultimately in the word, world of business. And since this is ultimately a uh, summit about the culture of the economy and the economy of culture, we think this is a very appropriate topic. Um, so I will kick the panel off by having our guests introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll dive into this uh, very fun uh, topic that's occupied uh, Michael and me for the last uh, two years while we were embarking on writing this book. So Jordan, I'll uh, throw it off to you for a brief introduction. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. And uh, let me tell you just a, a little bit about myself. So I am the uh, keyboardist with the band Dream Theater. Also, some of you might know me from my work with Liquid Tension Experiment. We're very excited because after 20, more than 20 years, we actually have a new album coming out, LTE3, and uh, managed to be somewhat productive in these crazy, crazy times. Um, at the same time as uh, running my music career and my live performance, although that hasn't happened too much. Um, I run a business, it's called Wisdom Music, and Wisdom Music uh, is a company that I put together because I had these crazy visions about musical expression and how technology could become closer to our human spirit and physicality and what we could do with all that uh, to making new uh, musical instruments and sounds. So uh, I run that. Our latest uh, software is called GeoShred, which puts together some interesting ideas about playing surfaces and, uh, and sound. Um, and then the other element to who I am and what I do is uh, I'm an educator. Uh, I've done a lot of teaching through the years um, online, in person, and I really value that. And uh, I work very closely with a lot of the companies that uh, make synthesizers and cutting edge music devices and uh, just kind of put it all together uh, to uh, stay creative and keep uh, my vision moving forward. Nice. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> cool. Uh, oh, sorry, I was on mute. Noah, I will, uh, I will turn it over, uh, over to you and you and I go, go way back. That's right. Well, first, uh, I'll say that I'm, I'm really um, happy to be with all of you and honored as well. And, and Jordan, um, I've been a big fan of your music for many, many years. It's a big honor to be with you on this panel. Um, and uh, Panos, of course, we've known each other for a long time. Um, I'll tell you briefly about who I am. Uh, my name is Noah, which is the short version of Achi Noah Menini. Um, I uh, come from a Yemenite family originally, that might be of interest to some people in uh, Abu Dhabi, <laughs> and, um, and I was born in Israel, then raised in New York City, and uh, returned to Israel when I was 17, so I do have a mixed, uh, mix of East-West identity. I guess I'm a singer-songwriter above everything. I love writing music and started doing it at a very young age. Um, I play percussion, I sing and play percussion and write songs. Um, I started my career, my professional career, 31 years ago when I was a student at the Ramon School of Music in Israel, Ramon School of Jazz and Contemporary Music. That's where I met Gildor, who's also on this panel, and he'll tell you more about Ramon. He was founder of that great school. Um, Gil and I uh, started our international career with an incredible opportunity given to us by 
the great, great Pat Metheny. And I will say that just behind me is a beautiful painting by Pat. <laughs> Bet you didn't know he was a painter. Wow. But he's also he's a multi-talented, incredible person. And I found this painting thrown in his bathroom, actually. <laughs> he, he was just going to throw it away. He's that modest and amazing. And I said, no, 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 I'm taking it. And I always keep it behind me because it gives me an enormous amount of, of um, inspiration. Pat, I think working with Pat really not only opened the doors to the world, to Gil and myself, the amazing amount of trust that he put in us. And he, he didn't want, he himself did not want to um, play on the album. He decided Gil's playing was great enough <laughs> and and give gave Gil that opportunity he brought the entire Pat Messini band to uh to the studio and um but also taught us a huge lesson about musicianship on the highest level about quest for excellence about perfectionism and about humility and just joy of music and love I just adore that man and I learned so much from him so that's how we got started. After that, Gil and I, we were, we've been on a roller coaster ride. This is again, Pat Lingo. He said, fasten your seatbelts. You guys are going to be going. We've been around the world several times, performed in many, many, many countries. We've made um, 17 albums um, and uh, we've created an enormous amount of music. We're very uh, creative in our, in, in the way that we approach music. It's very difficult to actually to put a uh, a title on us, what genre exactly do we prescribe to? Because we're cross generic, I guess. Basically, we just do our thing the best possible way uh, we can. In addition to that, um, Gil and I are involved in an incredible amount of um, activism. So we started by being very deeply involved in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Um, after having performed the rally where Yitzhak Rabin was murdered, which was a traumatic and formative event for us. Um, we start, I started express, expressing my views very, very clearly. That has brought us to very amazing, very dark and very illuminated places um, over the years. We're also involved in and in, in, uh, many other humanitarian causes and recently in the wave of demonstrations here in Israel about our democracy. So we're, we would say that, you know, we're protest movement people, um, uh, definitely alongside um, our music. Uh, we were also involved, we were also the founders of a startup company by the name of Fair Play Music, um, which was, I thought, an absolutely incredible idea that had to do with uh, taste in, in music, an algorithm that was very, very brilliant um, and in deciphering, un a unique way of deciphering musical taste and bringing musicians together on the, on the basis of uh, musical taste. Um, finally, we let that go after dealing with it for several years. Um, I, I think we were bit unlucky in the kind of partnerships we finally fell into, which is will inform maybe I, this will connect to what I might say later on about um, the way that we musicians approach the world differently in the way business people approach the world. And, um, and then how we cope with, with, with what, failure and dusting yeah. yourself. Yeah, up I, and yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, well, failure is a wonderful thing, you know, <laughs> it's such a, it's such a, a, a basis for, for learning. Um, Maybe I'll, again, uh, make a little comment that has to do with your the original question is how we musicians approach the world, because um, it fits very clear, very well into what I, I was saying now. Um, for myself as a musician, the best thing that can happen to me, uh, first of all, as Pat always says, the, the thing that you always want to be is the worst guy in the band, because that's how you learn, by just striving to be better. You know, that's me. everyone else is so great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Second is, I think that we totally play off mistakes. I mean, I know that for myself, when I improvise, whenever I do something like right, when I blunder and fall on my face, then I always see it as an opportunity to invent something. Okay, I've made a terrible mistake. I've fallen down. It, uh, by the way, I once physically fell on stage in a, <laughs> in a painful way. And I just, you know, just fell down again <laughs> and got up <laughs> and again, and then it became a pattern. So almost every mistake, if you make it into an interesting pattern, can be something incredibly creative. And I think that's one thing that um, musicians normally know how to do. But um, you know, let me let me quickly go to the uh, uh, the other panelists, and then we'll come back because I'm sure, I'm, sure. Uh, I'm excited to dive into this yeah. idea of how we learn from our uh, uh, from our uh, our failures, and ultimately how that's transferable to to other uh, parts of life. Um, so Gil, uh, the introduction, then Scott. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure and honor to be on this panel. 
Uh, I would say, well, Noah covered the, the last 31 years of my life because that's how long we have been collaborating. Uh, before that, I was uh, a guitarist, uh, composer, arranger, uh, I, I, um, I score, and um, my, um, I think my... Uh, maybe innovation, not innovation. I mean, my biggest project before I started the collaboration with Noah was to be a co-founder co of the Ramon School of Music. And uh, it, has, uh, it has become a, a really beautiful institution with very strong ties to the Berkeley College of Music, which connects us to Panos and, and the whole uh, thing. Uh, that's about it. Uh, we'll talk more about serious ideas. Th th thank you, Gil. Yeah, Gil. Uh, Scott, um, keen to dive into your background, similar to Gil and Noah and, and Jordan. You're multilingual. You're proficient in, in music uh, and in business. Um, so, yeah, uh, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, Scott Page here. Very thankful to be here with everybody, actually. This is great. Can't believe I'm awake. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, my background is What's really comes there, out of being both entertainment uh, technology and business. That's kind of been my life. Uh, as an entertainer, I'm mostly known for being the saxophone player with Pink Floyd for quite a few years. I played, I was in Super Tramp for a while. I played with Toto for a while. And I, you know, I played with everybody from James Brown to Chuck Berry to Mick Fleetwood. I've been, you know, been touring for many, many years, but uh, really got the bug about business and uh, really sort of split myself there. I'm on my actually fourth startup, my first company that I started called Seventh Level, I took public. There I, um, I actually, my, my favorite claim to fame is I directed and produced the world's first interactive cartoon. And so really started out in the early days on Windows machines, 25 megahertz Windows machines. Uh, so I, I have a technology background. My new company is called Think Experience. We're building immersive entertainment. And now I'm really focused on kind of new business models that deal with live, uh, real-time two-way and combining delivery services in, uh, in that way. And uh, you know, I've grown up in the music business all my life. My father was a musician. I grew up on a television show called The Lawrence Welk Show. Uh, so I was on that show for 14 years when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm my big claim to fame. I'm the only guy that's played in Lawrence Welk and Pink Floyd in the uh, entire world. So there's my one big. Uh, so anyway, mostly a technologist business guy. So I've kind of flipped. I, I still play a lot, do that. But my my real love is kind of combining business and entertainment together. That, uh, that's quite the combo, Scott. That's quite the combo. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been fun, uh, actually. You know, I'm yeah. so past, I'm so fascinated with technology and how it kind of new business models. And it's actually, I think this is the greatest time in history for the independent artist right now. And especially after COVID, you're looking at, you know, problems to solve like crazy. So, you know, these things here change the world for that, for musicians. A lot of business can be done now. Thanks. Uh, Michael, um, brief, uh, brief introduction. Yes, hi, I'm Michael Hendricks. As Pano said, I'm a co-author with him on Two Beats Ahead. Um, I'm a designer uh, by trade, a musician by hobby. Um, I'm the global design director at IDEO, which is an uh, innovation and consulting business uh, that uses design to help uh, companies make uh, new products and services in the world. One of my favorite companies on the planet. I love that company. Oh, man, thanks, Scott. I really mean that. I'm a big fan. <laughs> The process. Um, I love the process you guys do. Well, you know, it's um, the process I realized, and this is really what drew me to this topic, is very similar to um, writing a song. Mm -hmm. um, just the way we think about how, just how we get inspired, how we work with other, how we prototype or demo. Um, I'll share a lot of similarities. So I'm excited to be able to talk about that with uh, each of you here today. Um, I'm going to uh, actually ask the first question here and jordan i'm going to focus it on you and and wisdom music in particular because i um that's not something um i knew a lot about in your own history um could you tell us how your musical mind has helped you approach building a, a business um because I, I think for a lot of people that feels like a different topic than playing in a band but i'm curious yeah. where you might see the overlaps Absolutely. Um, first of all, I love this topic um, because I 
think a, a lot about it because every time I think that I'm involved in business, I kind of blink and go, wow, how did this happen? Well, let me tell you how this happened. So um, we have to uh, go back in time a, a little bit um, to a key moment. And it was um, when my wife and I just made a huge purchase of a very beautiful Steinway piano, uh, which I love, which is probably my favorite instrument of all the things that I play. I think it's, you know, just so close to my heart. Um, but around the same time as we bought this beautiful instrument, the first iPhone had come out. And of course, the first iPhone didn't make any really good sounds and it didn't really have anything very attractive on the screen at all. It had probably, I think in those days, it came out with a little like prototype keyboard that made uh, a simple like sawtooth waveform. But I was fascinated with that. And I would sit around with this iPhone, literally sliding my finger on the surface, making this, you know, ridiculous sound. But in my mind, of course, I heard something much greater. And I was just thinking that there was so many possibilities about what I could do with my hand on this, this multi-touch surface. So it got to a point where my wife basically said to me, what the hell are you doing? Why are you sitting there with your running your finger with that ridiculous sound? We have this incredible piano in the other room. Go play it and stop that. I said, well, no, no, honey, it's okay. I've got something in my mind. I just have a, I just have, I'm thinking that something is possible and I've got to see this through. She was like, okay, well, you're crazy. <laughs> Do whatever you want. <laughs> So uh, that year, I uh, kept my eye on what was going on in multi-touch devices and what was happening in the iTunes app store. I was interested in what people were creating for this new platform. And I decided to reach out to a developer that I thought he was doing something that was kind of related to what I was thinking. Not, not really, but enough that I thought I'd start there. And I called up the guy and I said, hey, um, I've got this idea for being able to touch the playing surface and being able to kind of morph waveforms. And at the same time as you're morphing the sonics, I wanna have visuals that are associated with each sound. And as I move my finger, I want them to all kind of be in synchronization and change. And he was like, okay, well, <laughs> wow. And unbelievably, he said, okay, let's do this. Let's start the project together. So that year, uh, we developed an application called MorphWiz, which in those days they had something called the Billboard Music App Awards. And MorphWiz uh, went on to win the number one place for the best music app. And it was amazing because, for, first of all, obviously an honor to be voted the number one music app, but I realized that my creativity brought me to a point where all of a sudden I was in business. So I was like, wow, okay. And it really had nothing to do other than with the fact that I had uh, a vision in mind that I wanted to share something that I was really passionate about. And I wanted, you know, just to bring to a lot of people and we put together this product and next thing you know, it's on a store and it's selling and it opened my world to the possibility of allowing my creativity to kind of flourish in a way that I could get my ideas to a lot of people and create, you know, this business. So that's the kind of thing that I've, that I've, you know, uh, taken advantage of so much in my life where I, I get to a space where I kind of look inside myself to see what creativity can I share with others? How can I create a tuning with the outside world and understand where everyone is, not only individually, but as a group? How can I just reach out and create this resonance uh, where it's going to really, really matter? You know, whether it's writing a song that's going to touch people or coming up with a creative app music application or visual application that's going to touch people and allow them to be you know, come together and be part, kind of part of this vision. Um, and I just see that as a, as a, uh, a grand concept in the way that musicians and creative people can interface with the world and make a real difference. I think that there's real, in many ways, you know, there's really no difference between just creating and being musical, artistic, poetic, whatever, and 
doing business. Obviously, there's a lot of other talents that come into play, other skills. But as far as using our creative brains, I think this is the beauty of it. This is the, the power of it, that we can think about resonance and improvisation and tuning and relationships and, and do it all from this very unique perspective. I'm just curious to ask yeah. you a question. Oh, I'm just curious. When you were working on the application, because obviously those were early days of technology. First of all, what year was that? Oh, it had to be when did the first iPhone come out? So like we're talking about 13, 14 years ago. Right. Did you find it interesting? Because um, I kind of made a career of being the bridge between technology and entertainment because, you know, tech guys want to know it's on or off. It's yes or no. There's no in between yeah. when you're building an application. There's no gray area. Whereas mm -hmm. musicians, we're kind of going like this. Let's throw mm -hmm. something up on the wall. Yeah, right, what right. was that like for you? Just out of curiosity. Uh, well, luckily, at the very beginning of this process in business, it was purely creative, purely creative. There was nobody else that was telling me what to do. There were no other like concerns about, you know, OK, well, the market is this and, you know, we have to think this way and you got to include that it was nothing like that. It was the it was really the purest form of putting out something that was in my heart, in my mind. And I had a passionate developer. And the amazing thing about that world, still to this day, although it's changed a little bit, but in those days, it was it was just that you could just build something. You know, an individual or a couple of guys could just put out an idea and get it in front of a lot of people. You know, luckily I was there kind of at the very beginning. So I still have that possibility where I can take an idea and, you know, put it out there and bing and see what happens. Right. Um, and and, that's and kind this of, is you know, in, in, in many ways, you're already touching on some of the stuff that informed how we went about this book, because Michael and I are both entrepreneurs, but, but both of our heart creative people. I have a background in music, he has a background in design. Mm. And through my own process, I realized that entrepreneurialism, at least in the classic definition, which most people tend to associate with simply the desire to create profit, it's mm. also as much a creative process and an iterative process that resembles a lot more the music making process than anything else. And in the book, we interview a number of, of, of uh, uh, renowned musicians, whether it's Justin Timberlake or Beyonce about their approach to experimentation, to collaboration, um, to this idea of what you were talking about, Jordan, which is you don't really know what you're doing. You're just sensing your way through it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, uh, Noah and Gil, in, 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 in all of us in this panel are multi multilingual and uh, equally versed in, in creating, in talking business, uh, in leading both musical groups as well as um, people in organizations. As a creative person, as a musician, when you were engaged in the business side of what you were doing, did you find that there were aspects of of you that were transferable um and if so what what were those and how has uh been a musician sort of informed that approach to to business and then scott i'd love to get your your thoughts on this as well should, should i should I answer that yeah well um you know i'm not going to say anything as if it's some kind of um you know I would say Torah from Mount Sinai, we would you say, <laughs> you know, I'm not, uh, I don't know much about business, I have to say. I think we, we left our startup because finally Gil and I just really wanted to be musicians. We wanted to deal with music and, and our world of music was so rich and fascinating that we left the world of business. We left it behind. Um, I can talk about the business of music within how we run our musical business. Um, and I think that there are certain things that we've done that have proved themselves. I mean, we've had this very long career. I don't know how many bands have stayed together as long as we have. Um, and the principles that are in place in this, in this thing, um, you know, it's the same musical principles that we use in this. First of all, we think as a team. So none of us have ever, both of us, have never been interested in stardom or diva-ish things. You know, we always are the we thing is much bigger for us than the me. So that is one principle that's always left. A second, we believe in people, meaning that if we work with people for a long period of time, we don't test them every five seconds to see if they're performing, and then we fire them if they've made a mistake or something like that. 
we choose the people we work with very, very carefully. So, and so we really try to get into who they are. Um, and if we recognize um, interesting qualities, human and qualities and talent, then we invest in, in those people over time. And, and even when they stumble, we don't let them go. I, and, and that has proven itself in an amazing way over the years. With, with promoters, for example, um, you know, they, they might not get you the biggest gigs for the most money, but if they love you and there's a lot of emotion there and resonance, our, our startup was built on resonance, on a real, you know, a passion about something where you resonate in, with the same wavelength. And you know, they'll be with you over years with this album and that project and they're curious and we work from, a, from that place of, of real collaboration. So we believe in people and we stick with them. And that's something that we've definitely gone with over the years. Um, I think another thing that, that is applicable to business is the idea that, um, that as musicians and everything that we do, we're always trying to solve some kind of a riddle. So there's something that, that is, you're very curious about. And I was really, I really related deeply to everything that Jordan said in the fact that we are, you know, playing. That's what we do. We play. We're very playful and curious. Our Why lot of people work? What? While normal people work, we yeah, musicians I mean, play. For us, mm -hmm. the playfulness and the curiosity and the trying, starting to solve the riddle and the mystery of music has been, you know, the essence of, of, of what we've done. And, and money always, for us, whatever money comes has come as a byproduct of that. We have never been people that have, and not in our startup either, we've never been people that have been thinking specifically about how am I now going to make money? Rather, how am I going to make something interesting, fascinating, that I love and that I'm passionate about and good at? And then that will bring finance, not the other way around. And in, in our thinking, that has always been the best policy. Every time throughout, throughout my career and in our startup as well. And I think that that's what finally led to its downfall, that, um, that the money or just the making money became stronger than what's going on here. Is it interesting? Is it beautiful? Is it curious? Is it useful to the world? Does it come from some deeper value? Whenever that became dominant, things topple. So in my career, I've just veered away from it and that has proven itself. In, in our startup, we got to a point where the business just ate us up. I mean, the people who were leading the business, that was our mistake. And we made a mistake in choice of partners, which led us too strongly into the business place and, and were unable to relate to the original, passionate, playful vision that we had. That's when it stopped. And we decided, okay, we're gonna put our focus back into music. And the business of music has been kind to us, I think, because of those things. No, I think that's super interesting because if you um, actually heard a lot of the same ideas and what Jordan was saying, like this pursuit of passion led to the building of a business. I'm curious, Scott, did you do you have a similar story? Well, I have my I've kind of taken. Well, I think in the early days that was the case. And then I got lucky, I, you know, from as far as some of the people I worked with were really good business people. So I took a start taking a different point of view. So what I work from a point of view is is. I look at, I try when I, I teach about this stuff, I try to say, you've got your creative part of the music, but business is also very creative, right? So I say, how do I blend the two together so that I always like try to, I, 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 I take a very, very uh, business-like approach to music now. Um, you know, for some people, it's like, is, I ask, is it a business or is it a hobby? If it's a business, then it needs to generate money, right? Uh, that's just kind of the thing. I come out of the entrepreneurial kind of world because the more money I can make, the more people I can hire, the more fun I can have making stuff, right? That's kind of my point of view. Um, but I always approach the two. So I look at the business models. I try to look at the success of having a, a commercial success tied to a as as a creative success and bring them together at the same time so my whole my whole approach is i take a very business approach to music and i totally get it because i am an artist and i understand that creative thing you know that balance of like being the creative side the other and what i found for most musicians and stuff today i mean most of them it's very hard to find musicians that have a business sense to them it's they're there there are those ones don't get me wrong but most of them you know they like to sit around want to smoke fatties write songs have a good old time and you know that's the day or my whole thing is you know i take i'm i'm a big lean startup guy i'm i'm 
big in that big time that all those principles failing fast and don't run out of resources and test and validate. And I try to make sure that there's a market before I actually go make anything uh, so that I understand it. And that's just, that's just my approach because again, I, I love the creativity of creating a business that's actually successful at the same time as making something that's creative. So I always think about putting all of those pieces together at the same time. I'm fascinated with Noah's um, talk about the way that you bring the best out of people. And as you were talking about the way that you went putting about your teams, you know, again, we, we, we tend to bifurcate in life and we tend to think in, in, uh, in either ors, but the truth is that life is, is life is interesting when you talk about the end. And when you were describing about the way you put, you collaborate with people, frankly, it could have been management 101. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what your job is as um, an organizer of teams to bring out the best of the people around you. And as you said, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't go around penalizing them with the first mistake. And I think this is some, it's a mistake that we often make uh, on the business side that we just expect people to uh, uh, sort of, you know, join our band, if you will, and all of a sudden just hit the ground running. But there is a nurturing process. There is a process of learning from each other and a trust that's built. So I'm curious from all of you, uh, in terms of collaboration, um, how do you go about finding the people that you want to bring into your orbit? And don't overthink about this as business people or musicians. Just answer the question like, how do you decide who to collaborate with and how do you go about choosing those collaborators? And maybe Gil, you can talk and then I'll uh, I can, go I around. Can say something about it. <clears throat> well, primarily I, I would like to say that um, the reward that, that moves our kind of business the way we look at it is joy versus pain we talk about pain in 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 the business side you identify a pain and you answer it and we, we as like sort of pure musicians we're looking for the joy side of it and that means that whenever we listen to for instance a guy playing bass like our current bass player or or playing drums we don't know these guys at all sometimes we, we sometimes we audition but many times we just look where the resonance is it's we always go back to resonance and when we find a strong feeling that no matter what i want to play with this guy or meet this guy um whether it's a guy who plays uh, and, and sort of creates a strange um, a fantastic arranger um we would approach these people and see whether the click is right whether the resonance is true usually if you have a, a strong intuition it usually works both ways it sh it shortens the path to to audition instead of like measuring how fast or how clean this guy played uh, you actually see if that's the, the the resonating person you want to work with that's the way we hire them and that's way and that's the same way is the way we reject them <laughs> occasionally <laughs> Um, yeah, we hardly ever reject people who have been already hired because the filtering of like coming in are stronger. Some people leave because they simply develop to a point where they pursue a, a solo career or, or different project of ways to grow. And that's fantastic. That's, that's a good thing. So that's, uh, um, that's something we've always been really have been important to us. And give a lot of space for the people who've worked with us to develop their thing. So whether it be really big solo spots, you know, for musicians, I always love to do that. Just let them play. Or if they have their projects that they're developing to encourage them, even if we know that means they might leave, you know, it, I'd prefer to have someone be an amazing, you know, going for it person that loves what they do and that feels respected and appreciated mm -hmm. and always very grateful to, to people and, and and everyone stays humble, humble, but you know we're demanding, but humble. That that has always worked for us. The game for me. Uh, is I'm curious. Yeah. Sorry, Scott. I'd like Scott, to go add ahead. one one last thing that the joy that drives music 
has two parts. One part has to do with the love and, and the passion for patterns, which is, which is common to mathematicians and scientists. And most people have it, but, but some people are suckers for it. And, you know, musicians are by definition. The other part of the joy, which is the reward of musician, is the joy of collaboration. Because the part of resonating in life by playing in an ensemble is the whole thing in itself. And the combination of the two, the love for pattern and the love for collaboration is what makes us tick and is our greatest reward. And then, like Jordan said, and like uh, Scott said, then at a certain moment, the reward can also be business and money and they are always byproducts of that vision and whatever is if you're talented is emanating from it yeah i always I, take, I, um oh, yeah, Scott. i was just real quick I, I always go by the uh, my whole thing is really about it's knowing who to call if i found anything out in business throughout the day it's always knowing who to call so that's my expertise i'm the worst guy in the room but i'm really good at knowing who to call and I think that goes back to my music, back to like, you know, when you start really looking at the subtleties of people and thinking about what those people will work like together. I'm always cons always trying to think if that guy and this guy get together and then they're going to they're going to they're going to fly. So they they know the difference. And I always ask every every time I work with with a lot of people and I teach, I ask this one question. Are you a starter or are you a finisher? <laughs> right. There's two different. Some people are really good starters and some people are really good finishers. I'm a. The, I'm a monster starter, right? But I have to then know I got to put those team together that knows how to finish, right? So it's really a combination, but that's the, that's the greatest thing you'll ever learn. And all the great people I know, they just know who to call. And that's really that's so sort clever. of an intuitive thing of putting the right people together with the right sense of soul. Because the whole thing of all my companies, everything I've ever done, it's about the culture. You build a culture inside that organization and it just flies on its own. It just starts taking a life of its own. And that's what fascinates me because, you know, having built businesses, having worked closely with uh, with business people, sometimes you tend to overthink how you go about building your team. So instead of thinking mm -hmm. of the broader context, which is what you're all describing, or the vibe, the culture, you tend to think of each of those individuals as simply a collection of individuals versus as part of a total. And in music, I think we tend to think of the broader context first and how people fit within that rather than the other way, the other mm -hmm. way around. Uh, I want to move us a, a bit to experimentation. I want to <laughs> direct this to, to, to Jordan. So in the book, um, uh, we have this uh, discussion with, with Justin Timberlake and I, you know, this, this is a guy who's had a 25 year career sold, I don't know, 50, 60 million records. And we were just, talking about his process of creating mm -hmm. and he says look i learned a lot from max martin who's maybe the the number one songwriter of all time other than lennon mccartney and uh max just said just keep writing just mm -hmm. keep writing and just in, in, in the book says i have one rule and that is dare to suck <laughs> just don't be afraid to make mistakes i'm i'm curious jordan you know both in the musical sense but also in your uh, uh, entrepreneurial endeavors, how has experimentation, what role does it play and how, what is your overall approach to it? That's an awesome question. So it makes me remember and think of one of my very important teachers at Juilliard, who was a teacher who was definitely outside the box. He was the one that wanted that was interested to allow me to do things that most of the people at Juilliard wanted to close down. I mean, I had an you know incredible piano instructor, but as an example, I walked into one of my first lessons and I was playing the, this is when I was nine years old and I was playing the box uh, C major prelude and uh, I started to play it. And then I kind of looked away from the music and started to make up my own interpretation of it and put my own notes in it. And uh, she said, wait a minute, she says, you, you can't do that here. This is, you know, this is Juilliard. You have to be looking at the music and read the page. And that's what we're interested in. <laughs> so I used to take my improvisations down the hall 
uh, the furthest practice room away from everybody. And, you know, anybody who wanted to come and, and, and join me, I would play boogie woogie and blues and, you know, songs from movies and just kind of hide that a little bit. But I had this one teacher that was a Juilliard teacher that uh, ended up teaching me privately who was a, a real inspiration. And, and what he allowed me to do was to... Uh, take in the outside influence, influences, not be afraid to listen to what was going on, whether it was the Beatles or the Dave Clark Five or Keith Jarrett or Chick Corea, and to internalize that. And my assignments would be, okay, this week you like that sound that Chick Corea is making, those kind of chords? Well, find out what they are and write a piece using the, using those. Interpret it bring it into yourself, write something. Okay, this next week, we're going to look at Schoenberg and we're going to look at the, you know, uh, how to create dissonance and what all that means. And I want you to write something with that. So this kind of a lesson was probably one of the greatest things because it opened me up to so many possibilities and got me to really want to think about different uh, types of sounds and different types of energies. So I be, kind of became this musician who was who was looking at music like some kind of a melting pot or a soup. So I would just, you know, my ears were open. I would listen to stuff, I would bring it in, and I would put the energy out to make it happen uh, myself. And that's one of the real, you know, key things about being a creative person who is productive is that, you know, you can be the most creative person in the world, but if you're not used to generating, if you're not actually doing it, creating, you'll get you get stuck and you won't have a mechanism for your for your art. That's why, you know, you've, we've all heard people say, oh, you know what, if you're a composer, you should go in and you should write, you know, at least a half an hour of music a, uh, a day. It doesn't matter if you're inspired, just go and write something. Because I think, you know, we, we all know that, you know, when you start a big project or a big, you know, a book or a piece of music, it's like, oh my God, well, uh, I've written a book before and it, uh, how am I going to do this again? Or, you know, you're starting writing a concerto. It's like, well, oh, wait, I wrote one, you know, three years ago, but can I do it again? But if you stay in the mode of creating, kind of keeping the, uh, you know, the machine going, I think that's part of what it's all about because you develop, you, not only do you, do, do you develop skills to make it happen, but you keep the creative juices flowing and it becomes part of your life that that's just what you do. And it, and it, and it continues to make it fluid and make it possible. I think that's a, a wonderful instruction. I, um, as Panas and I were working in the book, one thing we dove into was well, what are the misperceptions about musicians and and one of them was uh that musicians are undisciplined mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> as you all know uh that's far from the truth there yeah. there is so much uh practice that goes into being excellent um at your disciplined art disciplined at what right that's the question <laughs> <laughs> good yeah good scott um yeah. i think it's it's also i i appreciate jordan saying that um there's there's a practice of being generative. And I, I believe this is one of the key uh, characteristics of musicians. You know, in the business world, we we are surrounded by analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it is that is what's taught at business school is analysis. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of encouragement of generative ideas. Um, often, even if you're gonna decide to go into a space, a market, you're gonna analyze the market before you decide what you're gonna create. But mm -hmm. You know, the stories here have all been about stories of generation and passion. Um, and I would say, um, Gil, I love your characterization of not looking for the pain point, but looking for the joy point. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really fresh way to talk about that idea. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how, do, how, do, um, how do you listen for that joy in the world that, that inspires you, that helps you uh, decide to invest in an idea to pursue it. And I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Scott, again. Um, given you've done, you said three or four businesses now. Yep. Um, I do, I do appreciate that you said you do some analysis, but I, I have to believe there's something else going on that keeps well, you no question. pursuing these different businesses. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no question. I, I, I like, you know, I like being put in a box like, 
right? I mean, I love I love that I, I work from a perfect world scenario where everything is possible, but I like having a box that has to make me think about how I can be creative about being put in that box, right? How how can I do it? So that's why when I say the analysis, I'm I'm a big believer of I call it cons- controlled spontaneity. Like when I work with people, I I try to set it up and then I just throw the bomb in the middle of the room and just let it happen, right? And try to capture that in the space. Uh, but you know, I, I, and I think that's been more over the years. When I was younger, I was totally free. You know, I no, didn't want to hear anything about making any money or doing any business. I would fight. I didn't care. It was about the art. It was all about the art. Right. Until now, until I realized, well, you know, I wanted to pay for my house and all those other things. So how do I make it? How did how did I do it both? Right. How did I become get that passion? And so for me, it was always trying to live on the edge of new ideas. Right. Be kind of staying on that edge. That's why when I was in the, you know, hanging out, when I saw the CD-ROM, when I saw technology and I saw that CD-ROM and I was hanging out in the cyberpunk scene, I was hanging out with Timothy Leary. We were doing the, the, you know, the digital beings in San Francisco. Those were just really great, but being around a different kind of creative forces. And it was always great because obviously being a musician is one of the great things about it was, is just when you're a musician, there's just something that happens around business people, right? They, they love being around entertainers and creators. So it was a real, it was a nice kind of hook getting in the door there, but, you know, bringing that kind of controlled spontaneity around a, a, around a, a box is kind of how I like to work, you know? So I look at the problem. I like to try to solve a problem. I like to try to bring it because for me, otherwise it's like, it goes everywhere. And that's just me, right? It just, it, it, I can just go on and on and on. And I like to just kind of focus it down into a specific area. And I still think it's very creative, especially when you have to be put in a box and you have to be creative inside that box. Mm. Uh, you, you're thinking outside the box, inside the box. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Well, and, and you know, what I found fascinating about this comment of, instead of looking for pain, looking for the, uh, yeah. uh, the joy, when you think about it, the best companies in the world, that's what they do. You know, I don't think that Apple, famously co-founded by a very creative person, uh, is saying, let me just find out where the pain point of the customer is. They are bringing out the joy in people. And that is sort of the way that they're approaching it. Absolutely. Um, I I, I, want to, because we don't have a whole lot of time left, I want to quickly go to something that I think is relevant to our audience which is the idea of reinvention. You have all, and I, I, I know your careers uh, uh, you know, quite well, you have all had very long careers, very successful, very long careers, and you've weathered all kinds of changes, uh, and both in, in actual music business terms, from LPs to CDs to uh, streaming to maybe uh you know non-fungible tokens or whatever the next technology that's coming down the road you go, for brother, everybody. you can have that conversation uh, exactly and tokens um, are changing the world my friend <laughs> well, and, and, there, and there's something about the adaptability that you have all had that's made you successful but also your own ability to reinvent yourselves um and it's something that all of us in this uh near post-pandemic world um are having to deal with, you know, how do we adapt? How do we change even when sudden change happens? And actually asking how we adapt is not even a question because, well, we had to adapt. As a matter of fact, this very panel is a testament of adaptation because we would normally be in person in Abu Dhabi Mm -hmm. uh, and enjoying Mm -hmm. the amazing weather and the amazing people of Abu Dhabi (laughs) there in at at Berkeley Abu Dhabi. Um, So, I'd love to just get a quick uh, go around the room. Like, how do you approach your own reinvigoration, adaptation, reinvention during what I think all of you have had 30 plus, 40 plus year careers? Uh, Jordan? Sure, I'll start. Um, Well, again, it comes down to uh, being creative. Uh, being energized, you know, as you were speaking, it made me think of a lot of things. Uh, as musicians, you know, we we try to remain open, and I I often think 
have this visual kind of a, a musician or even myself like with antennas you know up and i'm trying to be free enough open enough receptive enough to take in the energy around me and to bring it out into my music and i feel like when that is in a, when when i'm an open channel uh, when you're working with another person, another musician who's an open channel, that's when the magic happens because of the bringing in everything, you know, outside. So, and in order to adapt, to change, to make things work, you need this kind of creativity. You need to not be afraid to make the change. You need to have the energy, the personal energy to be able to do it, which gets into a whole nother thing. Like, how do you take care of yourself so you're not you know coming up to blocks in your energy that's a more of a health thing you think of it as uh, you know some people use meditation you know a lot of musicians use musical meditation like for me one of my greatest meditations and ways to remain open and creative and and able to accept change is to sit at my piano and just not play necessarily for anybody else or maybe share but just find that space where I can go, wow, okay, now I've just, re- you know, I, this is a release for me. I feel great. I'm ready to move on and do the next thing. I think, you know, singers probably feel that, you know, more powerfully than anybody because you're generating tone within your own body and you're resonating and you're becoming, you know, physically really part of the, of the world. So, I think it all comes down to energy and creativity. And obviously we need to make things work, especially in these crazy times, because if you're just sitting around and, you know, waiting for your next show, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So what else can you do? How can you use your creativity interface with others? How can you socially connect instead of socially distance? Because, you know, being social is one of the vital things to us as human beings and there are plenty of ways to do it so um i just think it has to do with that balance of energy and passion and vision and kind of forward motion thinking and you know making your uh, allowing your creativity to become alive and sharing with others thank thanks jordan uh noah and gil curious about your approach to reinvention and we only have about uh, six minutes left, so uh, let me, uh, let me uh, yeah. throw one little one little thing. I think for me, it's uh, the depth of our motivations and the depth of our inspiration has a lot to do with it. Because uh, I'll, I'll give a concrete example. Uh, when when I think of music. I can say, okay, it's interesting. I can learn how to play this technique and that, and I can achieve, you know, I can understand what Chikoria was trying to do uh, with these, uh, you know, Spanish harmonies, whatever, and, uh, and, and symmetric diminished chords, whatever. But then when I think about Bach Fugue, and I'm saying, can I set that as an inspiration? How far am I from understanding the the clockworks of those big substructures that nourish all that geniusness and can i aspire to be there and 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 this is what i mean by the depth of the inspiration that keeps you going and it connects to what panos was saying because about adaptability because if somebody doesn't want to live why would he adapt to to change he wouldn't adapt because he doesn't have that desire but we all know that the power of life keeps us going in 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 very hard difficulties and that connects us to the topic of um, uh, innovation because innovation cannot exist without somebody being motivated by a very deep undercurrent of inspiration that keeps uh, boiling um, throughout whatever happens and 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 that will lead uh, I mean, statistically, at least it's a fertile ground. If you are creative and if you have that passion, there is a chance that you will fish <laughs> some innovation too and not just creativity, which is great. Yeah. I, I'd like to, I really would like to say something before the time is up. First of all, every, everything everyone said was fascinating. So thank you for all of that. You know, I for me, this corona period was one of the best things that happened to me in the last 20 years. Yeah. I have to say, <laughs> I enjoyed every minute of it. First of all, I really loved the stop in touring. 
it was important to get off the train that we couldn't stop. Our train was going so fast. I missed my family. I missed being at home. I just missed being in the studio and playing, being a playful musician again, because that is the essence of our motivation, just thinking up things and being creative. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, it, it brought home something that has been a huge part of my own life and our career, and that is the idea of generosity and, volu and, and volunteering and solidarity. All the good things that have happened to us in our career have come from a place of solidarity and sharing. When we've volunteered for things, when we've said, yeah, let's go for it. doesn't matter how much we're being paid right now. Let's just see what we can do to make things happen. So the first big thing that happened to us here in this studio was we were approached by a hospital in Bergamo, Italy. Um, that was Bergamo was going through a catastrophe and they wanted to raise money. They asked if we were willing to do a virtual concert in order to help them raise funds because there was a huge tragedy going on there. Gil and I had to learn in like 10 minutes how to do a streaming concert, how to get the cameras. We got an OBS, we, a black magic thing. We got a friend to help us do the visual editing. We learned how to do subtitles. We taught ourselves this thing in like two minutes. We raised like 250,000 euro for a hospital just by doing a show at home. And, and, and I used, you know, Scott was saying, I totally know, you gotta know who to call. I thought in my head, who are all the people I know in Italy, all the media people I ever met? Mm -hmm. I bugged them and said, you have to help us broadcast this show. We're going to try to raise money. And I called these people and finally got the manager of Rye Television to broadcast this home concert we did barefoot here in this studio in Israel yep. for millions of Italians. It was just such an amazing thing. It could have. And from then we started, we've become, this studio has become a TV studio. I mean, we've got old secondhand Nikon cameras and tripods. We've learned how to do the whole bit. And we started doing broadcasts for hospitals around the world and just for fun. We connected to Twitch, which is an amazing program for gamers, which we realized we yeah. could do a lot of cool things on Twitch. A lot of I learning mean, going on right now for artists. Yeah, you know, Scott, you were saying that. I mean, this yep. is such a time. Yep. And why is this so great? Because it separates the mice from the men. And what do I mean by this, right? I think that today, if you're a musician, that all you're, you care about is one ego driven. I need the masses to love me and to say, yeah, I need to make lots of money for my drug habits and my big cars and whatever. And I need a lot of cover up because I'm not really that talented. So I need like a billion other people yeah. to hoo-ha behind me. You're not going to survive this period. Yeah. But if you have something real inside you, and like Jordan said, you're creative and optimistic, you're curious, you keep learning things, like Scott said, all the time, yeah. you're in with it, you love doing this thing, yeah. then you'll find solutions and be creative and, and, and move forward in this, in this very interesting period. You know, for me, real quick, it's, it's just real simple. I only care about the ride. I, I really <laughs> don't care about the outcome because that's all an illusion. It's, it, it doesn't matter. Because so I can right. tell you in my life, it always works out. Because I've, I finally grasped this one concept. The only thing that's real is us talking right now. <laughs> everything else is an illusion. Two minutes ago is an illusion. Two minutes from now is an illusion. So when yeah. everything stopped for us, this was going to be our biggest year for Think and everything was going to happen. I got up and just said, well, that was an illusion. All the gigs we had and everything, I didn't do them, right? So I just sat around and said, okay, what's happening? Where are we going? And looked at what opportunities were there and looked at what process, what, what's happening? Where are the markets going? Where are the things going? And looked at and kind of reinvented our whole self and just, just go for it. Because remember, the only thing that matters is the ride. The only step that matters is the one you're taking right now. Yeah. Once I totally grasp that, then I do. You just surrender to what is is the whole game. You whatever happens happens, and you well, just got to look at on it. that That's one. How I approach it. So I don't. Even, the reinvention is just getting up and moving because. That's real. This is real. This is real. And you just stay on a path until you kind of figure out where you're going. Oh. Well, I uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone. I, I think we're out of time, but um, you know what's been interesting is you all talked about loving the process. And I think whether you're creating music or creating a new product, ultimately it's going to be frustrating. So love the process. And then the other thing that I'd like to, us to conclude with is just what Scott said about, you know who to call uh, Jordan and Noah and Gil, you touched a bit of the same uh, topic, which is you're able to synthesize stuff. You're able to bring disparate ideas together and make something new, which by the way, if you look at the classic definition of innovation, that is how Schumpeter uh, classified innovation, the ability to combine old things into something new. 
And mm -hmm. that's what we all do, whether as musicians, as creators, or as innovators. But uh, well, wow. we're out of time. I want to thank everybody. We could thank go you. on for uh, yeah. another Thanks. hour of this. Uh, Jordan, Gil, Noah, Scott, and of course, Michael, thank you. Um, and uh, Well, now at least I have four new people to call and thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was yes. so inspiring yes. to time. listen to you guys, my God. <laughs> Good luck with your book, Panos and Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll, thank I'll you. I just started it. April 6th. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Very I exciting. I look forward to uh, engaging with all of you. See you. Thank all you. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Nice meeting you all. Thank you so much. You too.